Well, hi everyone. It's another Sunday, and here I am with the latest webcast from the Folly Star Foundation's Yoda Guy movie exhibit uh, here in St. Martin. And, uh, you know, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Nick Maley. They call me the Yoda Guy. I, I uh, was a creature effects designer on 60 odd movies and worked on. Uh, on Yoda for Empire Strikes Back, and I, I do a bunch of other things as well. Folly Star Foundation is, um, you know, we do presentations every Sunday about creative techniques or outstanding personalities for our patrons and our supporters and creative minds everywhere. And today I'm going to be talking to uh, one of my co hosts, David. Whiteley about his Star Wars documentaries and an exciting new project uh, that he is bringing to YouTube. So let me just uh, see what we can do about that. We tracked down the talent behind Star Wars and brought to you the galaxy Britain built. We also brought you Toy Empire, but we wanted to do something more. I'm David Whiteley. I'm a fan like you. Hello there. So we decided to put all this together. Welcome to Star Wars Extra. You'll hear from the talent that brought the galaxy to life all those years ago. And the talent behind Star Wars today. I know I drove at least one of my coworkers crazy when I worked on uh, Mob Gideon. You are a whole family of Star Wars fans. We have got mum, dad, yeah. it's your brother, yep. uncle to uh, Luke. Luke is not really his name, no, it's not. But when it ends, do when it says directed by Gareth Edwards. It did feel like, yeah, okay, I can die now. And that's not all. <laughs> Dedicated to the memory of Jeremy Bullock, the original Mandalorian. My half brother, Jeremy. I've never given him a part in any of these films. And so I said to him, Jeremy, I think I've got a part for you. He's a bounty hunter called Boba Fett. So while they were filming here at Elstree, you'd have the art directors nipping out of the studio doors, you'd go and see the guys at Elstree Precision and say, can you now make this? they come back, show George Lucas, and say yes or no, and away they go. We'll see you soon on Star Wars Extra. Coming soon to YouTube. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Well, like and subscribe, I'm sure we're going to do. And, and <laughs> let me bring up uh, David so he can tell you more about it. David, how are you? I'm I haven't been for a while. Yeah, no, lovely to see you too. And Happy New Year. Yeah, Happy New Year to you and everybody else that's out there. I didn't say happy that. Happy New Year. Yeah, smack back in my legs. Anyway, um, so tell me about your new Star Wars Extra. What's uh, going on with that? Well, I mean, you know, many, many years ago now, it feels like forever ago, we, we created uh, the Galaxy Britain Built. Uh, and that's how I met you, Nick, and we became great friends. And, um, yeah, and I was very privileged to become friends with you and everybody else who who – uh, was in the documentary about the British the British people behind Star Wars, you know, the British talent behind Star Wars. Um, and uh, and then we made the, 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 the toy documentary, Toy Empire. A friend of mine suggested it as an idea, and then we went off and we made it. And I left the BBC at the end of last year. Um, the show I used to present um, came to an end. So I thought, well, I'm going to – I set up my own production company, Galaxy Productions, gratuitous plug there. Uh, yeah. And then I thought was a, <laughs> there's something else we would be good fun to do would be – kind of do um, a YouTube channel, Star Wars Extra, uh, with some friends. We've, we've kind of put some stuff together. Um, and part of what I've been looking at, I've always wanted to do an extra, a, a third documentary. Someone said, you're going for your trilogy when it comes to Star Wars documentaries. And one of them is um, the, the one I'm looking at now, or we're doing now, in fact, it's, it's virtually all in the can, is um, about the guys that helped to build the original Boba Fett costume. Now, when we <laughs> When we started making this, we had absolutely no idea. Of course, we didn't. That that you know that Boba Fett, you know this this character here, you know here he is um, was going to be was going to be in the Mandalorian. So it was rather <laughs> we couldn't quite believe it when we saw Good timing. Yeah, right. You know that, that he was that he was there, and there's this wonderful story. So when we did the Galaxy Britain built, 
I was contacted by this 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 engineering company, an engineering firm, uh, very close to Elstree Studios, uh, Elstree Precision. And during the making of Star Wars, um, the the guys had been had been kind of uh, contracted to to make some very intricate parts of R two D two and C three PO. So they made um, the the locking mechanism for R two D two that that goes into the computer that you see on the Death Star. And they made um, some really intricate parts of C-3PO, parts of the chest plate, the knee joints. And then when it came to the Empire Strikes Back, they were approached again about making stuff for this, for this bounty hunter, uh, Boba Fett. So, you know, these guys are used to making precision parts for, um, you know, research stuff that was going into space. So everything had to be really precise mm. <laughs> when it came to designing stuff for for you know, um, uh, you know, fantasy space travel, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It right. didn't have to be accurate at all. Yeah, I, you know, Boba Fett uh, started out as a character that was a super trooper. Yeah, that, uh, that was in um, in the states when they were doing uh, live appearances. They felt that Boba F that that Darth Vader was getting overexposed, and so he uh, he appeared all that armor appeared as a white super trooper um leading the stormtroopers uh, and then later on that you know when we were in england making the movie and they needed bounty hunters you know they just kind of said oh well i guess we'll yeah we could we, we will include him and and paint him up and and there he was you know yeah fantastic because when you see those original uh ralph macquarie concept art uh, pieces, beautiful uh, pieces of art, and you see this white character. As you say, Nick, you know he was a white uh, character. He was he was done as a, a a white figure, and then of course they, you know that that kind of progressed, and and Joe Johnson got involved as well, and they started to to, to paint this character um, to to what we know now. Um, and and it's it's interesting because we speak to Robert Watts, who was oh I know you're great friends with, with Robert Nick, and and he. Um, gave his half brother Jeremy the the role of of Boba Fett, and of course, sadly, yeah. lost Jeremy at the end of at the end of last year. Um, but but he said it, it was a character that kind of just evolved, as you say. It wasn't something that was on the page straight away that this is going to be this. It kind of yeah. evolved and 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 grew into the, to the character. And everybody kind of loved him. And and you, you're quite right with as the with the white super trooper then went on to being Boba Fett, and nobody knew who he was. He was he was kind of at all these events people dressed in this costume kind of really promote the empire strikes back alongside darth vader and everyone was so intrigued about this character and he was um and the the, the figure himself which i have here um was was a mail away um certainly was in the uk for palatoy so of course everyone all the kids wanted this we all wanted this as a kid um and and of course he looked cool no one knew if he was a goodie or a baddie um, no one quite under, knew, knew, knew what side he was on. Um, and I think very clever marketing from, from George Lucas to kind of have that character in all the, the pre-publicity, all the publicity in the yeah, building. But, you know, at the time, I don't think anybody expected any of those uh, bounty hunters to become as popular as they all became. <laughs> it was, um, you know, I think they were just filling the scene. Um, certainly Dengar, I did the makeup on Dengar to, um, uh, to make him look all scarred up, etc. And, uh, and I, you know, I'm sure that, um, no one really foresaw, uh, where all of it was going or the Boba Fett would be anything more than an incidental character. I mean, it's, it, you know, the fans kind of take over the, uh, the evolution in a way um through you know through their popularity but you know generally speaking this uh, star wars extra um channel that you're doing you're talking about one particular show you know the idea i guess is to take uh, you know stuff that you got from um all of those interviews that you did for the you know the the galaxy that uh, galaxy britain built and uh, utilize that as Absolutely. a as a resource to um, to then make lots and lots of of um, of releases, all about the making of uh, 
the classic trilogy, I'm sure, from those interviews, but mm -hmm. also through the Folly Star Foundation, you know, you got access through me to um, all of those guys that were, you know, that we were interviewing from uh, from the new movies as well. So, Absolutely, uh, yeah. I mean, it's great. I mean, it's, you know, it's you... going to be kind of exciting. And I'm sure that we will be uh, plugging each of your releases here on uh, Starnet Events. Thank you very much. Well, and, I, and I'm hoping, Nick, that you you, could, you can come on and do another interview. Though I, I've got so much in the can already, you know, but it's, but as you say, we've got all that wonderful resource there, the material. Also, you know, it, it, there's far more stuff that we did with Gary Kurtz, with John Mollo, John Mollo being the costume designer. Of course, John's no longer with us. So it'd be nice to kind of put some of that out there and to kind of, you know, for people to see, to see that kind of stuff as well. But also talking about you know, the people working on stuff now and also in the future as well. Of course, there's the merchandise. You know, there's so much stuff to talk about, you know, that all these these 10 new shows that have been announced by by Disney and Lucasfilm to be coming out, you know, and everyone's very excited about them. Right. Cool. Well, I'm going to look forward to that. And, uh, you know, yeah. and uh, thank you for joining us this morning and talking to us. Uh, actually, it's not. It's, it's this afternoon for you. It's only just turned to <laughs> afternoon here. <laughs> um, and it's still morning in you know in parts of the USA where people might be watching. So, um, so I'm gonna um, I'm gonna say thanks. And um, how do just remind us how do people connect and subscribe to this wonderful? Yeah, if, if, you, if you if you get onto YouTube, it's Star Wars Extra, and there's no e on it. We're we're being very economical with with the, the letters, so it's just X E R A. So Star Wars Extra. Extra. It's easy yeah. to remember. And you find us on Twitter cool. as well. Yeah, so, uh, guys, make sure that you uh, you subscribe with that. Uh, thanks, David. Thanks, I'm great to catch up. To, uh, to our talk that we did a little while ago about um, about the, uh, you know, about the, the making of the Galaxy that Bren built and your other um, Star Wars magnificent documentary. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, uh, I tell you, I, I, that's a lot to live up to. So thank you. Yes, I know. I know. I, I'm building you up. What can I say? Take care. We'll Take see. Care, my friend. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to, uh, you know, pull up the items from my screen share and hopefully um, we can get on with uh, the replay of uh, what we did before. I think it's here. As you can see, I've had a bit of a change around today. Um, Yoda is sitting in the back. He's keeping quiet at the moment, but he's he's keeping an eye on me to make sure that I get uh, things right. We've got David Whiteley that you know as being my co-host, um, but who's also a documentary maker and made this celebrated uh, documentary about the making of the classic Star Wars uh, movies, particularly the first one, which was very low budget. Yeah, it's uh, the galaxy that Britain built uh, with uh, David. It's obvious, right? It's Star Wars. It's amazing. I would argue that it was the greatest leap from what was before to after. It changed, definitely changed popular cinema for, you know, more than anything else. It was kind of like this amazing thing. I think as a kid, you, you picture it in this galaxy far, far away. And it's a real shock to learn one day that it was actually somewhere just off the M25. It was just off the 25, and uh, here's David to talk all about it. Okay? I didn't know you. Yeah, I'm good, David. How did, yeah. this, uh, how did this documentary ever come about? 
Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Whenever I see that, that clip back of Gareth Edwards, who, of course, is the, the Rogue One director, um, I, I look back at, at, at how the whole thing kind of came about, really. And I also look when I see all the clips of everybody talking, yourself included in this, I remember the kind of painstaking job of going through all of the interviews, you know, several hours long. And uh, typing up all the all the notes and what everybody said, 120,000 words it was over over quite a long period of time. But I, I've been, I've always been a Star Wars fan. I was I was born on on May the fourth, 1977. So May the fourth, Star Wars when, Day. When did you realise that you were born on Star Wars Day? Because you know, basically, when you were born, no one called it that. I, I mean, uh, at what point did you say, "I'm a Star Wars baby"? Well, I, well, for the documentary, probably, to kind of get as much publicity as possible. Yeah. Um, right. It was only kind of, you know, as, as kind of the years wore on and everybody started going May the 4th to be with you, um, mm. that, I, that I kind of cottoned on to the fact that I was I, very lucky to have been born on, on May the 4th. But, um, yeah, so, so I was born at a time when I didn't see the first one in the cinema because I was, I was just 21 days old when it came out in the States and it came out at Christmas uh, in 1977 in the UK. Um, and, uh, but I always loved it. It was always part of my life. Um, the first one I saw at the cinema was uh, was Return of the Jedi in 1983. Um, but that very vividly going to see Star Wars with my father, Return of the Jedi, and I was such a big fan. Of course, the toys were everywhere. The toys were everything. Star Wars was everything. T-shirts and merchandise was really kind of taking off. A very shrewd George Lucas, who, who realised the merchandise was the way to get things done his way. Um, yeah, and, and I often think, you know, if uh, George wasn't a very competent um, film director, um, he should have got the Oscar for the best businessman, you know, oh, because absolutely. he pushed uh, the stuff. I, I remember seeing something uh, written by um, uh, Charles Lippincott at one point, who was, as you know, was a, a, a yeah. guy in the background who was going to all the colleges trying to raise interest mm -hmm. and stuff. And he, he uh, wrote that he was um, involved in negotiating in the States, I guess, the first of the um of the of the merchandising um deals with marvel and uh, and with whoever was making the toys there um and um and how george was upset with him because he didn't feel he'd done a good enough uh, a, a good enough deal on that first movie because he made up for it on the second one <laughs> well it did and then some really to be fair yeah. i mean charles, charles Lippincott was as you say he was doing all the underground stuff he was he was getting into all his conventions and Tapping into what was already there, this audience that he knew would would lap up Star Wars. So, so when they had all the the preview screenings, um, they were they were they were busy. You know, they were they were really popular. Um, and and you know, for me, growing up in the UK, it was it was a big deal. But I, I don't really think that I kind of understood. Certainly, growing up, that that it was made in in the UK, made just outside of London. I think that. You know, we all think that it's, you know, Hollywood blockbuster and, and, and everything happens in Hollywood. And um, obviously George Lucas is American and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it transpired, of course, that um, a great deal of it was made in the UK. Um, I, still get a lot of, I still get a lot of people who come into the museum and look at me shocked. <laughs> they know it was made in England. You know, they think I went yeah. Hollywood rather than Hollywood came to England. And, and Absolutely. Uh, one has to give um, you know solid credit to the Americans who uh, who put together those ideas an adaptation largely of um, of the technology from 2001 a space odyssey but thrown together in a comic book style that captured more uh, more of a, of a solid audience than mm -hmm. the one that confused a lot of people um, and so I think um, I, I, you know it was uh, it, we have this term called pre-production, which sounds like everything before production. But actually, pre-production is what is the time is applied to the time that we spend in the studio. Before that, there's all the concept time, which might be another three years of doing all these drawings and doing these other things, which uh, were all being done in the states by you know Ralph McQuarrie, and, uh, you know, and um, and and others. And so um, it was very much a co-production. But as you as you pointed out so so perfectly in your documentary, which you know I will say this because you can't, but it's this documentary. People, you should try look try finding it. All right, it's not that hard to find. It's called the Galaxy the, the Galaxy Britain built, 
Um, and um, I think you'll find it on YouTube. But what's really nice about it is that it's done in a very, um, a very gentle way. And it's, it's not your big, you know, pushy, this is publicity for the movie documentary. This is a documentary about the individual people who came together to work on, on a movie that none of us really thought was going to be anything that special, um, trying to make give 110% of what we could on on a zero budget um it was uh, it, it you know it wasn't the glamorous thing that people expect and and your documentary kind of says that so well thank you thank you well it, it was it's interesting because i remember how it came about you asked how it came about and and, and i've been filming in london um on a story for 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 my tv show when i was coming back home on the train and I was flicking through Twitter, as one does, you know, I usually flicking through. And I saw that Mark Hamill was going to be talking to the to the student union at Cambridge. I thought, hey, this would be a really great chance to interview him. And cut a long story short, he he agreed. And then and then, and then publicity the production said well, it couldn't happen. So I thought, like, okay, I want to look at doing this properly. So I approached Disney, and they said, yeah, come and talk to us. Um, so the very first thing that happened was is that they gave us permission to film at Star Wars Celebration um in 2016 so basically they, they, they gave us permission to, to to film the star wars celebration and at this and i've always been i've, I've been making films uh, documentaries for a, a long time and i've always been of the opinion certainly the way i like to work is i'm very structured in the case of you know i don't film anything until i, I don't leave the office don't leave the studios until i've got it all structured and i know exactly what i'm going to do with the galaxy of britain built it became a very organic process so um so along we went and the very first thing was we filmed a star wars celebration so here we are, you know, and, and you know, I, I was kind of getting a bit immersed in it, really, and, and not thinking what the things I should be should be filming. So here we go. We've got, um, you know, this is the bit with, you know, with, with Mark Hamill was on stage. And it was all very exciting for us as a Star Wars fan. And then we started actually filming. So I was desperate to kind of get things in the can, um, which is the way I always kind of worked. And, and then we've got the back of Matt there, who, who is also the director on the, on the shoot, great friend of mine who ended up editing it as well, living with me for four years. Mark, one of the camera guys there. Uh, and here we go. This was the very first interview that we did. I've seen this guy somewhere before. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, and it, so, so basically, we're, we're walking along, and, and we weren't able to interview anybody particularly at the, at the, at the event. Um, but we had a chat with you. I remember speaking to your friend Philip as well. And then we arranged to meet you in the morning the next day. And we got your interview in the can, and it was the very first interview. In every department, the limited budget fueled the resourcefulness, not least of the British team, who also found themselves against the clock. We worked from like 8 o'clock in the morning until 11 at night because we were trying to fill a room full of aliens. And they only gave us 10 weeks to build, prepare for the movie. Uh, it wasn't such a big movie at the time. I was the new kid on the block. Um, I got all the rotten jobs, first of all, which is always the case. I made the, the, the eyes for a lot of the creatures in the canteen there. <laughs> in the room, there were like five, six of us. Uh, on one side of the room, we had all the mixers where we were foaming latex, so that filled the room with, with ammonia. And on the other side of the room, we were painting the characters with toluene paint, and that filled the room as well. So we were probably all high at the time. You know? um, I, on, on that first movie, I was really doing a lot of the groundwork. Uh, it was a great learning curve for me because we ended up being all-rounders. We were we were doing sculpting and we were making molds and we were building puppets. It was a time when I was needing to prove myself. Is that why you worked so many hours to make sure that you know if you were working on something, we then... just couldn't find anybody else who could do the yeah. job. You, you just know, had that to get was on just with it. the way that it was. Yes, we had um, ready. For the Galaxy Britain built. So um, I had the title already, and we had we had your fantastic interview. Um, but then I thought, well, we've got Nick's interview, but that was basically and a few shots of Star Wars celebration stuff that I mean we needed a lot more people, obviously. So otherwise it became the Nick Mady show. Not that there had been anything wrong with that, of course. <laughs> uh, but but we needed to, so we started trying to find everybody else. So this gentleman here, uh, John Moller, who was the, the costume designer, um, did took Ralph McQuarrie's amazing artwork. Um, and had to adapt that um, and turn it into stuff that could be worn um, by the actors, by the, by the performance. So I remember I had, I had an address for him, and I wrote to the address. It was the wrong address, but it didn't say BBC on the envelope. It got forwarded on to his wife. And then Louise phoned me up one day and said, she, you know, her and John would be delighted to see us. So we went along uh, on a very rainy day. It was raining mostly in the UK, as you know. Uh, you can see the rain on the windows there. 
And um, we went to his studio and Louise said, would you like me to get all the books out? I said, yeah. Now, a lot of his sketchbooks had been tucked away for something like 25, 35 what years or whatever. They, some of them dated back to 1976 when he first started working with George Lucas. And they just opened them up on the table. I remember trying to contain myself in time to be professional. Uh, but also the Star Wars fan in me was very excited that you had, you know, this this is like the, the very first workings of, of Star Wars. You know, the very first workings of Darth Vader's costume, of Princess Leia's outfits, of, of you know, Har of Harrison Ford's Han Solo and, and Mark Hamill's Luke Star Wars can work it only. And there it is in this book. So the next one here, here is the here is um, the very classic uh, look for, for Alec Guinness, Sir Alec Guinness in, in Star Wars uh, with his Jedi robes. And, and John said to us, he said, well, you know, he was looking at everything he could. He was, his background was, um, he was a military historian um, and he was taking the kind of military aspect of things because he worked on Dr. Zhivago before this uh, as a military advisor. And then he took all this stuff, kind of, there was kind of early, military outfits and kind of put them with robes etc to kind of give it that kind of uh, mystic monk look if you like which of course we now know is very recognizable as a jedi knight um very much in all the the modern stuff with, with, with the clone wars etc but to see that in his book he with these early sketches of how sir alec guinness would, would bring it to life he was quite burly in that in that shot there over that picture he looks like you've got, you've got a, a burly character yeah he looks, looks a little overweight but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, it is, yeah, it's the yeah, it's got the desert after you know desert rats and things. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. No one ever, no one ever raised the issue over the nearest supermarket. Uh, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure. You know, these things weren't, weren't talked about. Anyway, you, you'll know this gentleman here. Um, that's Matt, yeah. our, 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 our director, but also Robert Watts, the production supervisor. Um, yeah, great on, friend on Star Wars, great friend of yours, and I, I know that um, he's become a great friend of ours over the years, and and. He obviously was was very much behind a lot of the, the kind of um, everyday kind of get, uh, getting things together. To start yeah, with. people often don't mm. understand um, basically the structure um, behind the scenes. You know, they just know, oh, you know, George Lucas was the was the producer. Well, you know, whoever's listed as the producer is the one that gets the Oscar. Not the executive producer, not the line producer, but whoever's listed as the producer is the one that gets the Oscar. So they, you know, they kind of balance that out uh, uh, along the way. Um, executive producers are usually people who raised, uh, did some of the deals to raise the yeah, money. That's right, yeah. It might be uh, an associate producer, might be a star who uh, took a cut in their salary for an associate producer credit. Um, but uh, it's also, um, you know, often used for um, that and the line, the term line producer. Um, line producer is the one that's sitting in the office getting the job actually done and has a manager, a, a, a production manager under him who's signing the checks. But but the um, it's the line producer or, or the person doing that job that's talking to the studios and doing the deals that, you know, yeah, things in place. The nuts and bolts of how are we going to bring this together today, and that's and that's very much what uh, what Robert was doing. Absolutely, and, and you'd have seen him firsthand doing that, wouldn't you? Because yes, um, exactly. You know, and, and seeing what he was what he was up against, as, as you know, Nick. You know that the budget was was so small, and of course, it was this guy's job to kind of make that money go as far as possible. So he was doing everything he could to kind of make make the deals, wasn't he? Yeah, exactly. Um, so when, when we got Robert here, we, I managed to track Robert down through, through a colleague of mine and um, I spoke to his assistant and, and this was the moment when we, we got him here, we got him back to Elstree, Elstree Studios. Um, a lot of it isn't there now, but sound stages 7, 8 and 9, which is what they use for, for A New Hope, um, still there. And, and Robert walked in and we sat down to do the interview and here's some great pictures taken by a friend of mine, Simon, who's a... Simon Buck, who's a professional photographer, came along, took some for us on the day. And um, there we are, uh, chatting to Robert in his favourite studio, one of his favourite studios, under the lights, you know, sound stage eight it was. And he was so, it, it, he said it was like he was transported back. I'm sure it's the same with you, Nick, when you go to these places again, even though they're like a blank canvas. You yeah. go in and you can feel that energy. That's what he said on camera. When I started to do the rebuild on on uh, Yoda, the first effort, which which came to nothing in the end, but um, uh, you know, we uh, I was working with a sculptor in England, and 
um, we put together um, a sculpt based on something that he'd already done um, within, you know, like in two days. And I took it down to Elstree Studios, where one of my former um, assistants, who was a plasterer when he started with me, but went on to have a shop in Elstree, kind of called Lifecast, and, and does, you know, life mm. casts and effects and things for movies now. I was there in his, in his workshop, right? And it was kind of weird because, because you know, they cut the studio in half mm. and all the stuff, it was a bit sad because all the stuff where we actually built Yoda was, mm. was ripped out um, and gone and turned into a Tesco's. And, um, uh, but, but then at the same time, there was, uh, you know, there was the rest of it. It was a bit confusing because they'd moved the George Lucas stage. So yeah. George Lucas stage wasn't where it, it, it had been when I was there last. It was like the Starship Enterprise had been did up and been did down in the wrong place. <laughs> You're right. I mean, you go back to the place. It's like, it's like Robert said, you know, a lot of it was, was torn down, wasn't it, and turned into a supermarket. Yeah. So you've got all that. And yet they're now reinvesting uh, in that area because you know, the British the British movie industry is doing so well. You've got so much, so many um, movies being shot here uh, and so many top-end TV shows, you know, that, yeah. that are being shot here. But, but the, the expertise is here. Um, and obviously with Robert, for example, he didn't just work on, on Star Wars, he ended up working on the original Indiana Jones trilogy, ended up producing Temple of Doom and The Last Crusade, and working yeah. in exactly the same, exactly the same studios. So, yeah. um, he, he picks of the most loved uh, movies, certainly of that, right? Of all, um, certainly that era, yeah. And, and when, we, when we were kind of doing this, um, doing an interview, he said to me, no one's ever interviewed me for as long as this. And it was only an hour. Right. You know? and, and to me, that was, you know, I could have asked him more questions. But I thought what was very sad was that up until that point, no one had really kind of spoken to, to people like you. And, and well, let me tell another story, uh, um, if I may. You know, I was asked to first. The first convention I did was Star Wars Celebration Six in um, uh, in Orlando, and uh, you know, it was all new to me. And I, you know, I went. I sat there at my table, and you know, there's all these people that are there, and most of them, it was something like forty people doing autographs. And uh, a lot of them were, were um, you know, obviously we had our like five main stars there. Um, but then there were quite a few who were, you know, background characters, characters that had been, you know, just seen for a moment in the movie. You know? And there is Robert Watson. I haven't seen him for years and years and years. And, uh, you know, I, I'm always going to treat uh, Robert with respect because, you know, as a line producer, as an associate producer on, the, on those other movies, uh, line producer, I think, on the first one, you know, he, he is the boss. He's, you know, one of those top-notch guys, you know, and people were queuing up. And I thought yeah. that, was, that was because they, uh, they recognized, you know, the importance of the job that he'd done. And then I realized that they were, they were queuing up because he'd done a little cameo for a moment with no lines driving an at, -AT right? And yeah, so right, they, yeah. all wanted, they all wanted the photograph of the at, -AT driver. Right? <laughs> and that's so typical. I know, I know. It's interesting, isn't it? As you say, he had... I think it was him. It was him and Richard Marquand, who was the director of Return of the Jedi. Yeah. And they, they both ended up being the, the scout walker drivers in, in, in that scene in, in Return of the Jedi. And he, he does tell me how much he, kudos he gets to that. And you think, hang on, this guy sorted out everything for Star Wars, you know. Yeah. And you know, he had like a fleeting glimpse of the scene in, in Return of the Jedi. You know, uh, if, we'd known, if we'd known that at the time, I could have probably, you know, got a walk on park just by <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you what, give me a walk on part, I'll take 200 pounds a week left. And then I could have lived on it for the rest of my days. Exactly. If you, even if you've been a creature performer, Nick, you could have made one of your creatures and then, and then performed in it. Yeah, in Empire. do that at the time. No, exactly. And you'd have ended up being, you know. Having, so anyway, so this, at this point, I was, it was interesting because we had, we had these three guys. We had you, we had Robert, and we had John in the cap. And we, we put together a sizzle reel to kind of get a bit more funding and get a bit more interest from, from the network of the BBC. Um, which they did. They said, yeah, we love the idea of turning this into a long form documentary. Um, and then it kind of snowballed. And then, you know, if, they, if, if fate takes, it, it, it's, um, fate happens, isn't it? And I was chatting to a colleague of mine, um, Amanda, who was a picture editor at the BBC, freelance picture editor, wonderful person, brilliant editor. And she said to me, oh, yes, my friend, a friend of mine, my friend Colin, he's, he's editing a Star Wars movie. Said, Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> what? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll get in touch. With it. Anyway, so basically, she hooked us up, and and then, kind of long story short, I sent I sent Colin the um, the sizzle reel, and then Colin came back to me and said, "I'd love to be involved." You know, wow, this is amazing. You know, and then he said at the end of his email, "Do you mind if I forward it to my friend Gareth Edwards?" 
Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, no, that's fine. That's fine. So <laughs> then, then, then immediately, then Gareth emails me as well and says he'd love to be involved. So here we are. This is, this is us at BAFTA, me and, me and Colin. Yeah, um, it's Right. Yeah, they all started to snowball. So, so here we are on on uh, the day we interviewed Colin. Uh, we become great friends over the years, and, and I don't forget we had a bit of a technical issue that day with the camera, one of the cameras. So Colin gets on the phone straight away to his industry buddies to see if he can help us out. What kind of camera is it? It's FS7, right? Okay, he's, he's calling people up to see if he can help us. And we ended up being really very incompetent and very embarrassed. But anyway, we we, we managed to muddle through, and um, we did it. And Colin did a, a fantastic interview. You never forget the day you get the Star Wars phone call. I'd had surgery, I was upstairs in my house, and I can hear the phone ringing. And I'm trying to get down the stairs without ending up back in hospital for more surgery. <laughs> Pip Anderson, uh, the head of post-production at Lucasfilm, she wanted to talk to me about coming on board Rogue One. She'd been told by Gareth that I was recovering from surgery and I couldn't go to Pinewood straight away. And they, they waited for me, which was incredible. So four weeks later, I was able to drive again and I drove down to Pinewood. And they wanted to talk to me about process that Gareth and I had on Monsters. Uh, they, they explained it's going to be, you know, basically other editors. There'll be a studio, effectively like, you know, an editor that they want, sort of studio editor, which is somebody who'd worked on a $200 million movie before, which I certainly have to. So you didn't just work on the movie, did, did you, Colin? I mean, you ended up getting <laughs> the credit <laughs> for being the actual editor yes. of Rogue One. That's right. So a shared credit with J. Bez Olsen and with John Gilroy. And I was on it for 27 months in total. And uh, what was interesting, of course, was it was not only multiple editors, but multi multinationalities because Jay Bears is a New Zealander and John Gilroy is an American and I was the Brit. Lucasfilm still looked to Britain for its mix of talent, enthusiasm and attention to detail. When Gareth made Rogue One, essentially another prequel to the first Star Wars movie, he wanted to make sure it had the true feel of the 1970s. Gareth wanted Rogue One to be filmed traditionally the way it had been back in 1976 when they shot Star Wars at Elf Street. He wanted practical sets. He didn't want massive amounts of green screen. So you're actually walking onto a set with real X-Wings. You can go over and touch the X-Wing. Don't break it. And the droids are all actually really moving around. They're radio-controlled droids, and you know, and the uh, the aliens are all people in costumes. And remember when the costume tests came in, and I got to edit all the costume tests together for lighting and things. It was mind-boggling. Uh, talking about his, his career in film, and then of course how we got into Star Wars and, and what he did on, on, on Rogue One, which we'll, we'll find out a bit more about later on. And there we are, uh, in, at the, in the headquarters of BAFTA. Uh, and then we, we we end up coming back to see you. Yeah, well, um, I was kind of surprised because, you know, we'd done that interview and as far as I was concerned, that was it. I'd done my bit. We, we did this interview in, um, in, London. Uh, in London and then, you know, suddenly, you know, I've got you guys saying, oh, yeah, we're going to come. We're going to stay, you know, in that hotel about 100 yards down the street. And, you know, lo and behold. Um, the British talent who worked on Star Wars is now scattered far and wide. One of George Lucas's original team runs a museum here dedicated to the art of science fiction. After Star Wars and The Empire Strikes Back, Nick Bailey worked on cult classics Highlander, Kroll, and Clash of the Titans. So this is our alien display. Revenge of the Jedi over here. And here's our hand solo The museum is one of the island's biggest tourist attractions. It holds an exhaustive collection of Nick's weird and wonderful creations from his career in movies. But Nick is still putting his knowledge and skill to good use on a special project that's close to his heart. You know, I'm an old timer. I still like my water-based clay. Um, it's just much more subtle to, to work with. Nick was fundamental in building Yoda, the Jedi Master. He's rebuilt him using original designs and techniques and that takes him to fan conventions around the world. It was his hard work on The Empire Strikes Back that really made the difference to his career. When the, uh, when the main puppet was having a few hiccups, and they, every time they had to pull it out, the crew was standing around, uh, producer Robert Watts asked me if I could build a backup. It's hard for me to tell that story without getting emotional because uh, it was the turning point in my career. You know, it was the culmination of 13 years' work. 
and um, and so yeah, I don't want to cry on camera. You know? it's, uh, it's just a hard thing for me. But yes, there was a moment when myself and, and Bob Keane, who was one of the trainees, 18 year old, the first day after we'd worked 60 hours in three days, slept on the floor. After we'd finished, we slept in the uh, in, in the storeroom because we were too tired to drive home. And finally, we got to see, you know, the work that we'd done. And um, it was Yoda with his head in the box, throwing all this stuff over his shoulder. <laughs> Oh, oh. Hey, you could have broken this. Ah. Ah. Don't do that. Ah. <laughs> I knew at that moment that we'd done something that you know no one would ever forget. It's so hard to get to where you want to go. It's just so hard. And you've got so much emotion, so much faith in yourself. You have to, to get through 10 or 13 years. Um, when that moment comes, it's it's very hard. Yoda was very special to me. He, he changed my life, and so I, I really couldn't possibly um, say there was another creature that I, I was involved with that I have the same fondness for that I have for you, right? Yeah. So, oh, wow. But, you know, I, I just thought I'd throw in a couple of clips. Yeah. No, it's great because, because, you know, it, it, I never forget because, uh, okay, I, I can tell you, I thought we were going to have a bit of an easy time there. Um, and uh, we obviously had a nice time with you. But we had so much stress because the insurance hadn't come through. I think you may remember this at the time. So we, we thought we were going to have, you know, we'd have a, a couple of days from with you. We might actually get a, an afternoon off uh, and then go to LA to do the rest of the, the shoot. Then we'd probably some more in London. But there was... So, the, the BBC hadn't got the insurance details to film LA, the guys that we needed to get the permit from in LA. Otherwise, we couldn't film anything in Los Angeles. And this was the Friday. We were due to film the next day. And I was thinking, oh, my God. It was, it was very stressful, actually. And it, uh, yeah, it was, it was very worrying. And because and, uh, we had Gareth Edwards lined up, we had uh, assistant art director Les Dilley, and 20th Century Fox's Peter Beale, who's been on one of your panels a few weeks ago. And, and, and I'm, thinking, hey, I mean, I'm thinking, we need to film outside the Chinese theatre, we need to film the Hollywood side, all the stuff, you know, the, the, the stuff we needed to kind of build the story outside Fox Studios, all that kind of stuff. And I thought, well, if we haven't got this permit, then we're not going to be able to film. It, it, ain't, it, ain't like, it, it ain't like little old England where you can just go and film in the street. They are very permit-oriented there, but I have to admit that in the that I, I did shoot a complete um, um, music video in LA and, and we kind of forgot about the permit. <laughs> we, just, we, just, uh, we just kept on, you know, we drive up in a car, jump out, you know, run in front of the background, you know, film for five minutes. By the time they called someone and said, does this guy have a permit? We were back in the car and we got <laughs> yeah, see, that's the way to do it. Maybe we should have done that. Yeah, right. <laughs> they got a thousand bucks, I think you wanted. Right, yeah. You know, or two thousand bucks to, to kind of do it. But it, but yeah, we had to get that rubber stuff. We had to get the, the stuff done properly. And luckily, I kind of it was pretty much eleventh hour stuff. We we got the permit from from Film LA. So, um, but we we did enjoy that. And, and what was interesting was we made the original Galaxy, which was sixty minutes long. And what I was really excited about was the fact we were able to go back. We made the longer version, the 90 minute feature length, which came out of Christmas, and put more in of your, of, of, of St. Martin, more in of the, the museum, and have it all in there, which is great. So, so here, we are, here we are, there we go, look at that. There we are, there we go, look at that, look. Yeah, no, it is a great shot, actually. That's yeah, great, isn't it? Yeah, superb. Yeah. And, and we had, we had lots, of, lots of fun, but as I say, I, was, I remember the stress and the pressure of trying to, trying to make sure that we had everything ready. Um, so, anyway, so then we, then we eventually get to, to, to LA, and this gentleman here, uh, we interviewed him in, in Sunset Media Tower. I managed to tap up the former, I think it was the BBC Entertainment's correspondent, and he opened up for us. And we had this, this, and it wasn't a great room. I mean, look at it. I mean, it's not a brilliant room, but I thought, okay, we'll do it. And, and we weren't sure. We were obviously excited that Gareth was coming along. And it's like with everyone that we interviewed, it was always, you know, we were very excited when people turned up. I'll never forget the moment we saw Colin walk into the, the screening room at BAFTA. Oh, yeah. and that, he's, here, he's here, he's here. And then when, when Gareth was here at Sunset Media Tower, I went down to the basement and there he was on his phone. And then we, I thought, oh, he's here. He's here. And, and, you know, just the same as with Colin, with Gareth, we had about a three hour interview. He gave us three hours of his time. And um, we, we just kind of, you know, 
choose the cards about other things and then and then the cameras roll and i've material for another documentary oh, that we shot I, got, I got loads i got loads well, uh, you should be doing the uh, rogue one documentary next yeah well that would be great wouldn't it that would be the next thing and then we have this gentleman here you probably remember working with les billy yeah uh, he, was, he was on the art, art department um and and lives in la uh, between what's interesting he's kind of he's kind of retired semi-retired now and him and his wife have moved to baja mexico Okay. Uh, and, and that's where uh, George Lucas went and recruited these guys when they were working on Lucky Lady, which was the movie. That's right. Which, which is this movie here. Uh, they're all working on this film. The John Barry in charge, production designer. And basically, George and Gary Kurtz turned up, saw the, the work of these guys because they were working with um, William Katz. Show us again. Uh, show us again. Uh, sorry? Show, show us that again. I've just made yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, so there you go. Uh, there you go. Lucky lady. If you don't see it, it's a, it's a fun film. Um, and they were working on this movie. And Roger Christian got the call up as well to say they're great to go and work with them. And, and basically, you know, Stanley Donald was, was directing it. And you had um, uh, Willard and, and uh, Gloria Katz working on it. And they were the writers on American Graffiti. So, of course, George was the director of that. And Gary was the producer. They said, hey, come and see this film. Come and see the sets. The kind of things you're after. Um, down in you know for, for Star Wars, and they were also the ghostwriters for the first Star Wars. Yeah, exactly. So they were kind of involved in that as well. So so you know they, they, they go down, see the sets, get talking, and then George went right, and he just hired the, the whole gang. You know, John Barry, Norman Reynolds, uh, Les Dilly, and, and Roger Christian, and then he wants them. He wants them in the UK working working on Star Wars. Um, so that that kind of sold it to him. So Les was part of that team, and and Les is really humble. He's one of these guys, you know, uh, yeah. so grateful to be to be involved. Um, and and just absolutely loved it, and it really launched his career. He did, he did uh, so much art directing, and, and then eventually production designing as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, and here we are. We, we, we recognise this guy. We uh, we chatted a few weeks ago on one of the movie, movie magic uh, panels at convention. Uh, Peter Beale. Now he was he he was he, before Star Wars. He was working on the Omen, um, and he managed to make that for a uh, coming massively under budget, uh, massively under with with the price tag compared to what they could shoot it for in in America. So, so the, he was kind of the thrusting young blade, if you like, in, in London. Um, and his boss, Alan Ladd Jr., at 20th Century Fox, came to him and said, look, you know, we've got this guy here. Uh, I like the script. I like George Lucas. Can we make it? Because no one else was particularly interested. And Peter Beale said he went away and he looked at it and they broke it all down. And he, he worked with George and Gary. And worked out how they were going to do it. Um, on I think the initial budget was $4 million. Yeah. Which, yeah. which is like a big thing. Yeah, I know it gradually crept up, but anyway, this, yeah. we saw we saw Peter in, in his home in LA. In fact, he lived at this point very close to um, the Fox Tower, the Fox the Fox um, building that was the one used in Die Hard, and he now lives in uh, he now lives in Spain. And there we go. Look at this. Uh, here's a is that a cigarette lighter or is yeah. that a? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I in fact um, uh, I've got that too. But one thing, the most important weapon of all, was proving elusive. I hadn't tackled the lightsaber, and we called it the laser sword, because <laughs> we were British. <laughs> I knew this lightsaber was the Excalibur of this film. I knew it would be the iconic image. It was amazing. I went to um, Brunnings in Great Marlborough Street, who we rented all our photography equipment, anything we needed, and I'd buy equipment there. I just said to the owner, do you have anything here that's unusual, stuff that might be interesting? And um, he pointed me over the side of the room. He said, there's a load of boxes under there. I've looked at those for years. Go and have a rummage through. And it was the first box. It literally was covered in dust. And I pulled it out, opened the lid, and there was tissue paper. And then when I pulled it open, now it goes into slow motion. You know, the music rising, and out came a graphics handle. And I just took it and went, there it is. Brilliant. I loved it. This is the Holy Grail, and there was about five or six in there. We bought the lot. I raced back to the studios, got my T-strip, stuck that round the handle. I stuck seven round it. From the calculator I'd been breaking down, there was a bubble strip that illuminated the numbers, and they would magnify. And it just fitted into the clip, so I just cut it, stuck that in. I said, I think I found the lightsaber, George. He came over, just looked at it, and smiled. I mean, that's... That's the biggest approval you can get from George. He just smiled and held it. Yeah, exactly. Um, extraordinary stuff. And that's so typical of, of the way the whole movie was made. You know, 
um, obviously I'm, I'm kind of associated uh, more with the Moss Eisley Cantina, but uh, the drink dispensers behind the Moss Eisley Cantina, uh, in the Moss Eisley Cantina were, were pieces out of a Rolls Royce engine that they'd stuck up and that they then later on reused to be uh, the head of IG-88. So, I know, it's crazy, isn't it? Which is now IG-11 in, in the Mandalorian, so that kind of, that style. It was, yeah. it, it was was actually created. And this is the thing. I mean, I, I, I know you and I have had this conversation with on many occasions, Nick, and I've had this conversation with Robert on many occasions. You know, you get people trying to work out why things that were the way they were. Is that was that planned? Well, nothing was really planned in that sense. It was kind of, you know, does that does that fit in the with the aesthetic of Star Wars? Yeah, is um, it there? And is it dirt cheap? If it, yeah. if, it, if it's dirt cheap and it fits the aesthetic, that's it, it's in. It wasn't like let's you know design this. It was stuff that was already designed. No, um, you know, yeah. The day people pre-design things in a computer and, and 3D print them. Back in the day, you, you basically worked with what you could find Absolutely. and and made the bit that you couldn't, you know? Yeah, exactly. And and that was the mantra. And and I know that it's in the documentary, it's in my book, where, you know, Roger and co. would get in a plane, they'd fly to loads of different uh, airports around the UK airstrips and buy old aeroplane junk. And they'd ship it back to, to Ellsbury break it all down and they go right well, what looks interesting what can we use here that's gonna that can fill this area either the millennium falcon you know that was uh it's a bit like um uh, you know the spaceships were largely lumps of plywood that had uh, fx kits stuck to them right? yeah, exactly yeah and then spray it with the gray paint you know and, yeah, exactly. look a bit mm -hmm. uh, and that was and that was the mantra wasn't it and, and yeah, because i feel that that is really making the most of people's creativity you know as a um yeah, through our foundation, you know, one of the things that I try to do is to get people and in, instead of just playing with things that someone else invented on their phone to actually, you know, use their imagination to, uh, I say to little kids, you know, when, when you get a new fridge or a new TV, take the polystyrene packing and see what you can make out of it, you know, cut a bit out, make a foot. Make, the, <laughs> make a mess, yeah. <laughs> make a mess, yeah, that's okay because, you know, glue two bits together, hopefully not your fingers, but, uh, you know, that, uh, all of those things are things that fire creativity. They fire your imagination instead of you just sitting there going, uh, you know, pressing buttons that, that are whatever someone else created. Exactly. And I think that's it. exactly. And I remember Roger saying to me that he was given, a, I think, a very small budget in comparison to what everyone had for the design team. Yeah, well, yeah. he said he made that for 12 quid. So you know. Yeah, exactly. But he... But he, he was, very 12 quid is 12 pounds. So. Yeah, yeah, 12 pounds, yeah. And, and he, he, he came in under budget with all the stuff he had to do. I remember him saying that he was he was really up against it. He got the blaster sorted out. Princess Leia's was a starting pistol. He had Han Solo's blaster, which was a Mauser with a with gun sight put on the top. You know, the, the Stormtrooper's blasters were, were sterling some machine guns with short clips, and he put that T-strip around there. But the lightsaber, was, I think it was very close to the wire. I think you guys, well, they were all about to ship out to Tunisia. Lightsaber was a very, a, I mean, it's a sword, so you can imagine what a sword is, but um, it was a fairly alien kind of concept. Mm. Yeah, well, people overlook the fact that when you are, you, you know, if you're going to make a movie that's um, Indiana Jones and it's set in Egypt, people know what Egypt looks like. I mean, mm. you've got reference to say this is a pyramid and this mm. is side and you know this is what the germans wore you know but here you are saying i'm going to create a whole new world and everybody has to try and do something that is exactly the opposite where people don't look at it and say oh they just got a thing from a pyramid and stuck painted it yellow you know <laughs> it's right it's like yeah it's like everybody had to collectively get inside george lucas's brain and work out what he was thinking right. And, and almost kind of help him nudge things towards the right way as well. So it was kind of a collective thinking, wasn't it? Certainly with, with the people that were, were very were closest to him. Uh, through that. So here we are. Here we are. Well, you, you just shown the clip. Have you, have you, you, yeah, so there we are. So there, there we are filming with, with Roger. And he's still got that one of those prototypes that he has to this, to this day that, 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 that he built. Uh, ah, here we are. So, so, so this guy, um, Gary Kurtz, sadly no longer with us. Um, we yeah. dedicated the latest version to, to him, to remember his memory and John Mollers. And sadly, John's no longer with us either. And, and I've, I feel very privileged to have done you know, the last interviews with John and, and with Gary. Um, and I remember Gary turning up here, and, and poor Gary, he was, he was rushing around doing many projects as he always was. And uh, he, after he did the interview, he cracked, there was, a, there was a big box of luxury chocolate biscuits in the office. 
and he <laughs> broke it open. I, started, I said, because we were so in awe of the fact we got Gary Kurtz here and we are chatting to him, that we hadn't, we hadn't bothered to sort out any food. And I felt really awful about that, but he was great. And, and in Roger was there as well. It was nice for them to be reunited. And Gary did the most beautiful interview with us, uh, very generous with his time, as was, was, was everybody. He was a very gentle man. Yeah, well. yeah. Um, and obviously, so what was he like? What was he like on, on, on you know, with you guys? But he, I, like I say, he, he was, um, I, I believe at that point in time, he was a Quaker. And, um, you know, he, he was a rather spiritual um, chap. Uh, and uh, often I've heard it said that, you know, a lot of the, uh, you know, the essence of the force, you know, came from Gary. Yeah, yeah. He was that more spiritual person. And um, and certainly there were people wandering around that I thought were were Mormons at the time. I, I tell a story about um, having nailed one of the guys to the floor and, and uh, George, <laughs> Lucas, George Lucas came in with uh, these people that had been backers to the, to the movie, and I'll tell you that another time. But, um, <laughs> I think I'll hear it now. <laughs> yeah, uh, anyway, you know, he was just always a very gentle, uh, I, that's my memory of him, a very gentle soul. He used to come into a lot of the meetings where Stuart was yeah. um, was deciding, you know, what Yoda was going to look like, and, you know, they'd go into, into, I wasn't a party to that, I was I was in the main workshop, but, you know, they'd go into uh, Stuart's room and they'd be in there for an hour at a time, uh, basically looking at where the sculpt was and, and, and talking concepts. And then they go away for another 10 days before they came back and did it all again. So, um, yeah. but he, um, but that was my, that was my, I don't think he was really a, a hands-on producer. I think he was more of a, a raised money. I think maybe that it was, you know, the Quakers owned uh, IBM. So, uh, you know, I think it was more a matter of him putting, putting money together than, actually running around making sure that uh you know that the, that the tea trucks were there or anything yeah absolutely and i, I think he was there I, from what i can just from what i gleaned really the kind of he was almost there as, as morale as well wasn't he because he was he, he had a great relationship with a lot of the people on set and a lot of the crew and, and a lot of the, the cast um you can see that with a lot of the photographs that you see from behind the scenes and i'll never forget a very bizarre moment where we were we were editing the original version and i was in the edit suite with matt and um, we found a load of photographs online that were that were hit. And we're phoning him up. <laughs> and I phoned him up from my, my mobile phone. And I said, uh, I said, oh, Gary. Uh, it's very, oh, yeah. uh, I said, um, any, he always asked how the edit was going, how the film was going. And I said, um, is there any chance we could use? He said, any pictures you find of mine, you can use. Yeah. Uh, and that was the generosity of the guy. And and I, I thanked him. And then I got off the phone and I said, you didn't realize I just phoned the producer of Star Wars. He just said, yeah, help, help yourselves. You know, he was so... Kind yeah. and generous, and you say a very gentle soul, um, and just a, just a very nice guy, um, and and couldn't do enough for you. Um, and as I say, he, he, you know, wonderful guy, and, and very sad he's, he's no longer with us. And as I say, I feel very privileged to have been able to to kind of get his stories and make it part of part of the documentary. Surely. Now you may recognise this place. Uh, you know, it's it's um, Cardington, Cardington now Cardington Studios uh, in Bedfordshire, in the middle of England. Um, he never went there. You know what? There, but it's it's. It's, it's basically was was used as the, the I think it's what might be the one next to it actually was used as the the map backing for the rebel base uh -huh. punctu punctuation shot towards the end of, of Star Wars um, and there's a and I remember interviewing Gareth when they were making Rogue One and they were going around he said they were going around all these different places to try and find you know a suitable location to build Yavin you know the actual rebel base mm -hmm. um, and and when they were there they said to Gareth well you realise this is the place. In 1976, they filmed. They said, "Well, we've got to do it here." We, you know, so they built the entire hangar in one of these giant places here, and and it's just we did some pickup shots for the, for the documentary. But these places are vast, and and um, I know many people that have filmed movies here, and they're still shooting movies here now. Uh, they shot Batman Begins here, became Gotham City inside there. Uh, they shot the live action Dumbo in here a couple of years ago. So yeah, they, it's always being used for for, for different things. But, but the very fact that I love the idea that this is where the, this the, the old airship place, the R101 was stored here. Yeah. And it had the history uh, with, with, you know, with the airships. And then you had the history of, of Star Wars spaceships as well in, in, within that. I think it's something very special. And, and you drive along the road, you can't see it. You always have it, you see it moving on the horizon. Yeah, there, there are so many of those studios. I mean, people don't think about Denim Studio anymore. Yeah. It kind of got run down, but in the 30s, you know, everybody was there. Charles Lawton was there, um, you know, all the big stars were making 
movie theater, history, people lose track of it, you know. Yeah. And people probably in Denham just drive by and, and don't even think about the place. And, and all the history. And I think, um, isn't that where, I think it's where John Williams with the LSO recorded the very first score for Star Wars was Denham. I, I don't know. Um, and then, and then, it, then it reverted to, to Abbey Road after that when Denham closed down. So the very first one was, was Denham Studios. Um, now this, Galaxy Britain built one out in 2017. We went back. So we kind of decided to make it bigger and longer and better and the kind of version that we wanted to make. A bit like George Lucas, I suppose, <laughs> without any money at all. So we kind of went, we, we found some more people to put in the documentary and we spoke to this fantastic lady, Anne Skinner. Now Anne was the continuity person on, on Star Wars and she was there for every single take of every single scene shot in Tunisia and, and in Elstree. Not the pickups in, in, in LA, but all the stuff shot in Tunisia and, and in Britain. And so she was there for every single thing. And there's a great line. I don't know whether you've got the clip or not, Nick, but I've managed to put it together. But I, I, we, no, that, that, the, so Lucasfilm gave us permission to film um, her continuity Polaroids for this for the extended edition of Galaxy. Um, and also her annotated scripts, all of her notes on all of her scripts that she wrote during the film. Um, and and a very modest person. She went on to become a producer. She worked with Richard Attenborough for many, many years. Um, and she, the, the scene where Sir Alec Guinness is struggling, he was apparently he was struggling to kind of get to grips with the uh, the speech when he, which he gives to Luke about you know, the power of the force. And, you he know, didn't like the dialogue at all. No, he found it funky. Yeah, he said that. And, and we, we found an interview that was on the BBC, which we shoved into the dock, uh -huh. um, uh, which, which shows him saying he actually was intrigued by the story. He liked the idea of working with George Lucas. Uh, obviously, he got a percentage, which he did very well from. Um, but he also um, was struggling with this. And, and Anne went to George and said, look, Alec is struggling with this a bit. Uh, he, he can get it, but, he, but can we, re, re, we rewrite it? And George said yes. So they rewrote it. And in her pen, so in her, on her script, in her pencil writing, is, is how they rewrote the whole, the whole scene. Right. Um, explaining to Luke the, 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 what the force is. Um, yeah. and, and George looked at it and went, yeah, that's great. And, but to Anne, that was nothing. But of course, yeah. to us now, all these years later, as Star Wars fans, you go, that's one of the most famous speeches of all time in movie yeah, history. Yeah, exactly. And I think she gave that script to BAFTA to, uh, so, by, uh, uh, for, their, for their archive. She did, yeah. Big now, this is, I mentioned the, um, the London Symphony Orchestra. Now, we also got a couple of guys who were the principals uh, on, on uh, the original. Um, and this is Robert Borton. Now, he was the bassoonist. And um, this is him, and I couldn't, I couldn't get the bit from the actual doc, but I thought I'd just use, use this bit. And that's what Robert does, okay? So you think, okay, it's part of the, the, the London Symphony Orchestra. You know, John Williams is conducting. So when they got this and they turned the page and they realized what it was, they thought it was going to be very interesting. Yeah, couple, coupled with this, the, the, the next guy on the, on the slide here um, is uh, Dennis Wick, who was uh, principal trombonist as well. So these guys, they said it was just the most wonderful few days working with, with John Williams. Um, and well, at the time, John Williams, uh, I mean, he, he, was, he was doing um, good stuff with Steven Spielberg um, yeah. in the States. But really, you know, once again, we didn't know who John Williams was. I mean, he wasn't, you know, the people didn't make a, as much of a fuss. Uh, I think he did Jaws, didn't he? Didn't he? He'd done Jaws, he'd done Jaws before, by then, yeah, because Jaws right. was yeah. So, yeah. You know, and everybody, you know, associates with the music for Jaws. But at that point in time, no one ran around and said, who wrote the music? Who wrote the music, right? And so, you know, a lot of people, they would go in and they would sit there and, and there was a quote that um, I, I can't remember who it was we were interviewing. Who, uh, who said that they were there um, when, it was probably Peter Beale, but they were there when they were uh, recording uh, with the London Symphony Orchestra sitting in the box. And, and then uh, John Williams came in and said, well, it's not a bad band you've got. There. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. He said, and Robert said this. Robert said this. It's not a bad band you've got their band. You know, it was Andre Previn's London Symphony Orchestra. Yeah, um, but, uh, but, you know, they, they just had a blast doing it. And, and, he, and Robert Borton in the documentary does this great bit. He said they, they, did, the, they did the opening scene, the opening crawl, and the, you've got the, the, the blockade runner goes over, and then the Star Destroyer goes over. That incredible opening scene that captured a generation. Absolutely. They recorded it, and then they, they, they turned around 
to look at playback and look at the screen at the end and watch it all back. And they were completely blown away. And they said that at that point, they knew that they were going to be doing something that was very, very special. Yeah, because the orchestra is looking at their little piece of paper that tells yeah. them what they're supposed to play. It's not until they turn around and they can see what the conductor is seeing on the screen where the movie is running, which he is conducting the music to match. I think a lot of people who don't make movies don't really understand that process either, you know. Uh, he has to, John Williams has to write the music in the first place, you know, sitting somewhere, you know, based on, I don't know whether he has a small um, movie over it would have been in those days yeah. that he sit and watch the movie while he's writing the music. I mean, that's mind boggling right there. But, you know, but then, you know, he gets the orchestra and they are playing the, the, the film on a big screen, which he is watching, which is behind the orchestra while he's conducting to time the music to match what's on the film. And it's not until the orchestra mm -hmm. turns to watch the replay that they realize just how great what they've just done is. Yeah, it's it's incredible, isn't it? And you're right. He, he, and Dennis said it in the documentary, the, the trombonist. He said he, it was incredible to watch how he fit that music to every part of that movie, um, which I which we all take for granted now. I think I think we kind of take that, that yeah, for granted. Yeah. I mean, all the all these different layers of of, of filmmaking. But I have to be honest. I have to be honest. The, the movies that didn't have John, I I felt the uh, I felt the lack of him. You know, uh, Star Wars without John Williams, I'm afraid. Left me feeling, uh, you know, somewhat uh, disappointed. So, well, I, I, I think that you know, it's interesting. In our documentary, we found this wonderful um, archive interview with, with Steven Spielberg talking about how coming, bringing those kind of classical scores back, making it popular again, because it wasn't the, the done thing to do in the seventies, um, but something with a, a space opera it required that that level of classical, you know, that classical score to kind of have that there. You know, yeah, you're right. It was. So, what else have we got? On so this, uh, this is the last shot. This is me and the crew saying, saying we're done. So, in the middle is Matt, who directed and edited it. The, the guy, the camera guy, is a chap called Martin Giles, known as Beanie. And then you've got me. And that was our very last day. Anyway, then we move on to this. I'm going to do my gratuitous plug. Um, so, so um, hey, give a give a good plug. I'm going to give it a plug. So, basically, you said all these interviews we had. Well, we had lots and lots of interviews. And I, and I, a couple of people said, well, why don't you write a book? And I've never written a book before, and I've been a, you know, I, I use the term journalist in the loosest possible term um, for 25 years, a broadcaster and filmmaker. And I, and I write a lot, um, but I've never written a book before. Um, so I went to one publisher and they said, oh, we're not sure. Try this one in America. And I was very pleased that um, Bear Man and Media, uh, based in Florida, decided to take a punt on me, you know, being a first time author. Um, so we turned, we turned some of the documentary. I redid a lot of the interviews, um, interviewed a lot of people again and got lots of photographs and put them in, um, which were given to me by, by Robert and, and Les Dilly, their own private collections. Uh, some of it is mind-blowing. Um, so, so the book is out at the moment, it came out in November, and it, but it came out at a time when I was working on the Galaxy Britain film and our Star Wars toy documentary, Toy Empire, and I didn't have time to think, I thought, the book's out on Amazon, and I didn't quite realise it was out. Um, so we, were, we had this one big Star Wars night on BBC4 at Christmas, and I was Everything had to be ready for that. And I hadn't really got a, had a chance to digest the fact that, you know, the book that my poor wife had proofread time and time again um, was, was now out. Um, and anyway, this, here, here's some of the pictures inside it, that, which, are, which are fascinating, I think. Here we've got a picture from, from Robert Watts. And then you've got uh, Ralph McQuarrie with George Lucas and the art director, uh, Norman Reynolds. And I'd love to imagine being a fly on the wall in there. I mean, you were there, to be fair. <laughs> you were probably down the corridor somewhere, you know. I wasn't. I was in another. I was in the in the studio, but I was in another room. You were getting hard ammonia at the time. Yeah, right. uh, <laughs> that's one of my favourite quotes. Uh, and this is great because I was chatting to Robert about this, and, and John Barry's here. He was the production supervisor. Uh, sorry, the, the, the production designer uh, on Star Wars. He was on Empire, and he and he had he, he got meningitis, and he, he passed away during the production of, of Empire Strikes Back. But um, here they are on a, on a recce for a potential location. The Empire Strikes Back on the equator in Kenya. Of course, that location was never used. So it'd be interesting to know what what that potentially could have been, or where that potentially could have been in the Star Wars universe. Um, back in that would have been probably 1979 or 1978. And this is one of my favourites. This is great. I love this picture. I went through a lot of stuff with Robert, and and um, during the heat wave in Britain in 1976, 
you've got, you know, Harrison Ford, Carrie Fisher, Mark Hamill, you know, all in the UK, um, away from home. And apparently, you know, Robert says that they, they hadn't had Yorkshire puddings and roast beef. So he said, come on over for Sunday lunch. So there they are in London. In the picture, you can see um, you've got Robert and his wife, Robert's assistant, Pat Carr. You've got Harrison looking cool at the back. You've got Anthony Daniels popping up. You've got Mark Hamill putting a funny face with a hat on. And I said, well, where's Carrie Fisher? He said, well, she took the picture, of course. Yeah. So they, had, they, all, they all had Sunday lunch together. And there's another picture of Carrie at the, at the, at, at, um, at the dinner table with them. And then afterwards, apparently Mark uh, started, a, uh, started a water fight. Uh, with the kids in uh, the garden because it was the heat one. Like Mark, you know, Mark yeah. was, a that was always uh, always amusing us. Uh, people think of Harrison Ford as as being you know the leader of the troop, but it, it really on the on the floor that wasn't the case. Carrie was always messing around, um, and you weren't ever quite sure what to expect from her because she was a Hollywood princess, and uh, you know, and at eighteen, nineteen, you weren't going to be able to. Um, control her in any way and so uh, and and then Mark was the one that was always you know really funny you know he was always cracking jokes um, yeah you can see that in the behind the scenes stuff can't you in all the behind yeah. the scenes footage that they're kind of still emerging now you see that they all lark about together you can tell that Mark is is kind of the ringleader with the, with the kind of jolly jakes shall we say um, so here we are so you mentioned Toy Empire um, so I went back to the BBC and said look I want to make a story a film a friend of mine rick came up to me and said look i really think that we should make a film uh, about um star wars toys um obviously kenna got the, the license in america got a very good deal with, with george lucas um and kenna needed a, a, a sister company to make the toys for the uk there are many toy manufacturers around the world making you know got the contract to make star wars toys in the uk it's Palo toy now Palo toy were very successful they're doing brilliantly with action man which was gi joe in america um tiny tears uh, dolls and they had the mainline train line uh, toy range and um, they got Star Wars which was just absolutely incredible so what's interesting with this documentary um, it's, it's 30 minutes and it kind of when you speak to the people involved with with um, getting the marketing done and the manufacturing done it kind of parallels what George Lucas had to do to try and get things going because just as the movie world the movie industry didn't want to know with George Lucas's script apart from Fox. Um, the retailers in the UK were interested in, in Star Wars. You know, this is actually the, the core of what, um, of the conversation yeah. that Charles Lipitor was having. He was saying that, you know, he could go to Marvel and say, oh, this is a new movie and you really ought to make a, a, you know, a comic about this. And they'd say, well, yeah, but it's science fiction and is it going to be a success? We've got all the production costs of making a comic and distributing a comic and maybe nobody buys it right so you know you know as i as i as i say over and over again star wars wasn't star wars until it became <laughs> star wars, star wars. <laughs> right you know and and so it, it it's a it, it was the same thing with the toys and george was really pissed apparently over over the fact that he didn't get a better deal but you know the deal that he, i think they finally came up in the states was you know they had to make a certain amount of money before you know there were any royalties that were going yeah. to be paid. um of course the second movie uh, really cashed in on all of that stuff but this was that that first deal yeah exactly and um obviously the, the merchandise certainly helped with generating the funds for, for george to have more control um, with the with the Empire Strikes Back, right. um, but what was interesting, as you say, you know, they, people weren't interested. So, of course, in America, it came out in May May twenty fifth, nineteen seventy seven. It didn't hit the cinemas in the UK until December twenty seventh. So, a huge gap. You wouldn't you wouldn't dream of that happening now. Huge gap in time. And also, there are only so many prints of the film, so it was rolled out very slowly across the UK. Of course, the major cities and areas were at first. List that had made that movie mm -hmm. heard about it being a big hit. Which was a bit of a really, you know, <laughs> right, you know it's like oh, yeah. well, that, that, that kids movie that we made that's been a big hit. Yeah, okay, well, I, okay, you know, no problem. And so yeah. six months went by before we actually. It was Christmas, as I remember it, and and you know we all queued up uh, at long queue, uh, you know, to set it, a queue outside in in. Uh, in, in England in December, oh, a great fun. experience. And you know, I mean, where we are, we all go in, and I, we, most of us, we haven't seen each other for you know for a long, long while. 
And um, because even though you know, you see these people, you work with them for for six months or a year, and then you don't see them for two years until they happen to be working on the same thing again. And and then, you know, so it was a bit like a family reunion. Um, and then this movie opened with that amazing oh. opening and the quadraphonic sound that none of us had had in a cinema before that made us think there was an earthquake in the, in the uh, you know, in the lobby before uh, before the thing started. And, you know, and there it was. And everybody in the in the theatre, all the crew and their family, everybody stood up and and cheered. It was wow. a, an extraordinary moment. Oh, what about, what was it like for you then? Was it, was it emotional seeing it when you saw it all back? It was it was uplifting, you know. It was uplifting, but you know, once again, I in those in, in that first movie, I was the new kid on the block. Still, I had, uh, you know, I, I had moved on from Star Wars was the cutting ground for me, uh, and then you know we went on to do a thing with Gene Roddenberry and and Superman one and two. So I was feeling more comfortable in my in my you know professional position. Um, than I was when I did the other, but I couldn't honestly turn around and say, "Oh yeah, you know, I, you know, I made that and I made that," because you know, I made the eyes out of this guy and this guy and this guy, and you know, I made the tassel of mohawk for for Greedo, and oh, and I stuck all the warts on him. You know, I couldn't really lay claim to anything that specific in that movie, but it was just a thrill that this that we had made this movie that was. It was going to change the way that movies were made, and effectively was the really? was the Wizard of Oz of the seventies. Yeah, it was the catalyst, wasn't it? It was the catalyst that changed movie movie uh, the movie the world forever. And and you know, people still want to make the next Star Wars. I mean, whatever that might be. Um, I don't think anybody's kind of come even close, really, apart from more Star Wars within that within that universe. Well, um, the youngsters who grow up with movies today, you know, Marvel and all of that stuff and Star Wars, they probably just see us being all the same thing. But uh, really, um, really, it's not. There hasn't been anything that has changed the way that the basis of movies are made. The, the, you know, even Superman, suddenly we were running around with tons of blue screen in those days. Yeah lots of flying sequences and stuff that maybe they wouldn't have had the courage to do if we hadn't if we hadn't previously done uh something else i often i often say you know it's easy to build on what someone else has already done exactly uh, having the courage to do it the first time um i i have this analogy that i explain to young people i say if you go to the bank manager and you say <laughs> want to open the first dry cleaning store that's ever been opened, they scratch their head and they say, I don't understand, what is it, right? And say, so, well, it's the place where people take their clothes and uh, and they go through this process and they come out really clean and they go, oh, you want to open a laundry? You go, no, no, it's not really a laundry. It's not like that. You know, it's kind of, it's new and it's when they say, well, I don't know about this newfangled dry cleaning thing, but I'll give you money to open a laundry, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Soon as you've done it and everybody's made their claim on it, the next guy goes in, he says, I want to open the laundry. And they say, Have you seen that dry cleaning thing down the street? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Everyone, it, it's standing on the shoulders of giants, isn't it, really? It's, yeah. it's the way it all works. And, 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 it's, and it's the same with, with the toys, you know, coming back to the toys. It was, you know, because up until this point, you didn't have figures this big. You know, you had everything was a big, you know, 12 inch doll. And, yeah. 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 And, and, this, and this was revolutionary. So you've got, you know, here's the, Here's the production line, you know, in, in Colville, in Leicestershire, middle of England. Um, they were flat out and run up to Christmas because once the ball got rolling, of course, they were inundated. They were, there was there's one scene in the, in the documentary where the guy is trying to sell, you know, uh, sell the, uh, the figures. He takes, his, he takes all his buyers to see the movie. He plonks down a bottle of whiskey in front of his main buyer, one of his best buyers, at the end of it, and he comes back. And uh, he's drunk about a third to a half of the bottle <laughs> at that time, having just watched the movie. And he said, uh, well then, Bob, how many, um, are you interested? How many figures would you like? He said, I'm going to take a million. <laughs> and so you bought a million, a million Star Wars figures straight away, having seen the movie. And, right. and having the foresight, you know, this is going to be a big hit. And we want a part of that. Um, so, you know, and all these toys, I mean, I've still got my originals. You know, I've got the, you know, got the, the Atat there, you know, the Imperial Walker and, and the Falcon. Um, in you know in this place, and when you go there, when we filmed there, it's still it's still a factory. They don't still make Star Wars toys, obviously, because it closed down a long time ago. But to, you can still see it, and, and there's a conference center, and then all the guys remain friends who, who worked on, on on it together. And these are the kind of things that they would have to kind of get 
um, the retailers excited to whet their appetites and they'd have these big advertising campaigns. But quite frankly, by the time Jedi came out, they didn't really need to do much. But I think that's what so, that they found so sad. They thought that, I think we all did, didn't we, in 1983, that Star Wars would carry on. It didn't for a long time. And then, of course, had a resurgence with, with the special editions and then the prequels and, and where we are today. Um, but yeah, it went off a cliff, didn't it? So there's a great story that isn't in the documentary. I, I haven't touched upon this, but when, when everything fell apart in Leicestershire and, and, and come 1984, 1985, I remember as a child going to a place, we'd go to Woolworths, um, and uh, you, would, you would get a bag of, was it five or six? Five or six figures for 99 pence. So there's a tiny amount of money to, to kind of um, uh, to, to spend to get some Star Wars figures. But then it really went off the cliff. And then at Leicestershire, at Colville, um, where they were making the figures, they ended up putting a load in landfill. So they had this fabled landfill site somewhere in the middle of the English countryside, all bulldozed over, and all these toys are in, uh, you know, covered up, put in monks a load of other trash. But it's there, uh, probably for the taking if somebody wants it, but I wouldn't advise doing that. I wouldn't advise, you know. I have this image, you know, of people going to try and, you know, dig it out. <laughs> it's like, like looking for David's <laughs> treasure or something. Yeah, yeah. exactly, exactly. Yeah. And trying to find all that stuff, you know. So, so it kind of, a, you know. Um, but we've got, to, I don't know if you can see, have you still got the screen up? Is it still there? Is it? No, it's not on that. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, great. So basically, so I was turned into a toy, a part of the film. And, and um, yeah, it's, it's great that it's going to get a global audience so, um, so people can kind of see how the guys at Palatoy did because there was that great documentary series that's still going, you know, made, you know, um, The Toys That Made Us on Netflix. Uh, and they did, they did a whole series, on, a whole episode on Kenner. Um, so we decided to do one on, on Palatoy. So I'm looking forward to seeing it when I get it. Oh, great, yeah. Um, but before we, before we do that, there's, there's an interview that I've got here that, um, that, you, that we haven't run yet. Uh, I think, if I'm honest, if I was working on that movie and you read that screenplay and you didn't know George Lucas, you know, and you hadn't seen maybe the concept art, you might go, what the hell is this? Like, this sounds stupid. Like, it does. There is, in any other hands, it's a terrible movie, right? But in George Lucas's hands and in the crew that came together around him, like, they made a masterpiece. <laughs> So that was our, uh, hey, excuse my penny, I was making some hand Solo, run it this way, hand Solo in Carbonites while uh, that was running. Um, so uh, that was our recording for today. And uh, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the panel, uh, you can re-watch it any time over the next couple of weeks, wherever it is that you're watching it right now. Um, you know, it's, um, it, it, but please consider, if you enjoyed it, uh, becoming a Follow Your Star Foundation supporter because, um, you know, I think I'm, we're all hoping that COVID is going to die down and everything's going to pick up and that, that the vaccine is going to fix uh, everything. And, and I think that uh, it's going to have a significant impact. Got my fingers crossed for that. Um, but here we're really dependent on the cruise ships and they are um they're determined to run bubble cruises where they won't allow any of their passengers when they do come back they won't allow them to come to town here and so i think we're gonna have to try and survive for at least another year um before we can really get back to any sort of normalcy so uh, remember we're in the caribbean where we rely entirely on tourists so uh really consider uh, perhaps being uh, one of our uh, one of our patrons and um let me put up the uh, let me put up the patreon link um people support us with a five dollar donation or a ten dollar donation or or whatever they feel uh, we're worth and um and we would really appreciate uh, whatever uh, you can help um 
we put on these shows originally for our patrons, our Patreon patrons, um, and also for those people who support us by um, by making donations and getting, uh, you know, you can see here we've got a, a beyond um, hand here, we've got the original scripts that the classic Star Wars trilogy was made from. Um, anyone who's interested in any of those pieces should just uh, PM me on Facebook. Uh, all income goes to uh, the Folly Star Foundation and keeping this museum alive through uh, this uh, extraordinary time. And we aim to encourage everyone to follow their dreams and live extraordinary lives, which uh, you may have gathered I've been quite lucky to do. So this is that Yoda guy, Nick Maley, saying, have a great week. And may the force expand your horizons and be with you always. <laughs>